Hello, everybody. Uh, so thank you for coming. I'm here to talk to you a little bit about the mainframe um, and how we've been working for several decades um, on open source and Linux on the mainframe. Um, specifically, I'm going to hone in on the past 20 years. Um, and that's pretty much when Linux started um, on the mainframe. So a little bit about my background. Um, some of you may know me from some of my past work in the open source world. Um, I've worked on Debian and Ubuntu. And that's kind of where I started. Um, and then about eight years ago, I started working on the OpenStack project. I was a member of the infrastructure team there. Um, before I joined IBM, I was working on uh, Apache Mesos. And then in, later in, in that, I started getting into Kubernetes. So if you see a pattern here, <laughs> um, I've been working on Linux distributions and distributed systems, um, almost all cloud-based. And my actual day job in most of these roles was as a Linux systems administrator. So I was managing these tools um, and building these big infrastructures across cloud platforms. Um, and now I work on mainframes, <laughs> um, which may seem like a very strange pivot um, for someone who spent their whole career working in cloud and distributed systems. Um, but for me, I was interested in a new challenge in my career. Um, I, cloud is cool and it was a lot of fun. And I was really deep into the infrastructure stuff, going to a lot of conferences and events and things. Um, but I, I kind of had this old like hardware geeky um, love for alternative architectures from x86. So um, if you could see down next to me, I have a Spark Ultra 10 sitting here. I've got a Raspberry Pi on my desk. <laughs> um, and so, I, I just have a fascination with this stuff. So when IBM came around and said, hey, you want to work on IBM Z? I was like, what's IBM Z? <laughs> so IBM Z is a mainframe. And uh, I decided to come on board as a developer advocate to talk to people like myself who are uh, involved in open source communities and come from a Linux and developer background. Um, so that's me, and that's how I ended up here. <laughs> um, I want to let you know if you have any questions throughout this session. I'm going to try to keep an eye on the Q and A, um, but this is the first time I've done like a Q and A and talk at the same time. So we'll see how that goes. If I can't keep up with them, I'll, I'll just read them at the end. Um, so, but feel free to ask questions if you have any as they come up. So the first question, and the question I asked myself a year and a half ago, <laughs> uh, was what is a mainframe? Uh, so I kind of had this 1960s picture in my head. Um, a lot of the news articles you read about mainframes say they're obsolete. Um, having worked in distributed systems, a lot of the customers we worked with were trying to modernize their infrastructure. And for that, they meant getting rid of the mainframe and moving everything to cloud services. Um, and I, I watched a lot of those projects kind of end before they got rid of the mainframe. And I didn't really think about that pattern much um, and until I, I started this role um, where I really came to understand what they are and why it was so hard to get rid of them. Um, but it turns out mainframes are actually quite modern. <laughs> um, IBM releases a new, a new version every two years, historically, like in the past uh, recent history, it's been every two years. So uh, the Z15, um, was released in 2019 in September. And we just released like another version of that back in April of this year. So the latest mainframes are from this year. <laughs> um, we, and they're all got modern stuff inside. But what is it exactly? Um, before I joined, I read this book, What on Earth is a Mainframe? Um, I think I had to buy it used because it's not around anymore. Um, but that was a super nice introduction. Um, but basically, it's it's a very data centric machine. Um, if you think about the first companies and organizations that needed a computer, um, they were very focused on uh, industries that needed to process data. Um, of course, this is the 1960s, they weren't making websites and they weren't uh, really connecting people in any way. Um, but if you look back in computing history, the first computer ever built was for the US census. Um, so it's, it's people who really need to handle data. And so that is what the mainframe is focused around. It's you, you hear terms like batch processing and data sets a lot in the mainframe world. So what does it look like inside? This was like the first thing I did when I started, when I joined, I, I asked everyone, I'm like, do you have pictures of what's inside? And they're like, it doesn't matter. 
we never even see the mainframes anyway. We all just terminal into them. And I was like, I don't care. I want to see what it looks like inside. <laughs> um, so eventually I, I was pointed to some, some pictures. Um, so this shows what the inside looks like. Um, it's a little hard to find a color that looks shows up well on this. So I'll just kind of explain. Uh, so there's a bunch of, uh, there's a bunch of power that powers this. They come in air cooled and water cooled versions. Um, and then these, these IO drawers have all your IO cards. Um, they do a variety of things. Some of them will do encryption. Some of them do um, uh, actually connecting to your, to your um, storage arrays and things. Um, and they, um, handle different types of processing than the central processors do. So the CPC is the, the central processor drawer. Um, this is like a fully loaded machine. So it's got five drawers and it, it's four um, like 19 inch racks width. So each one of these little segments of the four is 19 inches. So they'll fit in like a standard rack space, um, which is really nice because that's kind of a new thing with a mainframe. It used to be they kind of needed their special spot in the data center, but now they just fit into standard spots. Um, so it's got the gigabit switches and the support elements, which is how you interact with the mainframe if you're, you're using it like, like you're actually at, at the terminal using it. Um, a very, very important thing for this talk <laughs> is that it's not x86. Uh, depending on who you talk to, uh, the architecture is going to call, be called IBM Z or Z architecture. In the Linux world, you'll often see S390X. So if you look at the binaries that are released, S390X is what's going to be in the, in the open source binaries, um, just like AMD64 um, or uh, ARM or whatnot. So it's S390X. Um, that comes from because the first uh, mainframe was an S360, and so that that the the you know or it was just that that name has kind of followed it along because it's the same architecture, um, slightly different bit number. So it was 31 bits at one point. Now it's 64 bits. Um, but inside uh, a fully loaded mainframe these days comes with 190 processors. Uh, those are 5.2 gigahertz each. Um, and I actually didn't include the picture of the chip that included the caches, but since this is all very data oriented, the processors have really huge caches so they can handle processing a lot of data. Um, there's 12 cores per chip. And then on the machine, you can have up to 40 terabytes of RAM, which is a lot. I don't need to tell you that. <laughs> um, I'll make these slides available later too. Um, but this link is, is one that I, I, in our blog post I wrote when it came out in September. Um, about the new machines, because I was like, oh, everyone needs to see the hardware pictures. And I don't want them to have a hard time like I did <laughs> to find them. Um, you may have noticed I haven't mentioned storage at all. Uh, and that's because the machines are really just giant processing machines with their I.O. cards and their um, their memory and their CPUs. Um, storage is, is somewhere else. So if you want like the best and most amazing storage, you're gonna buy the DS8900F. That is six petabytes of, of storage on flash. Um, it's probably really, really expensive because <laughs> it's kind of amazing. Um, but there's all kinds of storage systems and, and different companies make them. But essentially you, you attach a storage machine to a mainframe because the mainframe does not have storage on its own. And the mainframes these days run Linux and they have for over 20 years. And this is the hook that got me in. Um, the other thing that I thought of when I thought of mainframes was how closed and proprietary um, they are. And that was not compelling to me because I am an open source person and I really love Linux and I've worked on it my whole life. So, or my whole career. So I haven't, I wasn't really interested in the proprietary side of the mainframe. Um, but I started digging into the history and how it works. So this is kind of just a, a basic picture of how Linux runs on it. So in the mainframe world, you have something called an LPAR, which is a logical partition. And that's, it's, you can kind of think of it as its own little computer because when you put an operating system on an LPAR, it thinks it's all by itself. It doesn't know about the rest of the machine. It's like physically isolated. Um, so on an LPAR, you can put on ZOS, which is the traditional operating system for the mainframe, um, or you can run Linux directly on an LPAR. But more commonly, people will run Linux on top of a virtualization layer. 
And the reason they do that was be is because it is a lot easier to manage that way. So traditionally you have ZVM, which I will talk about because it's super cool. Um, but one of the really exciting things for me is that you don't have to use ZVM. You can also use KVM. Um, and yes, I mean the open source project. And what that means is you can use all of like the libvirt tools. Um, we have production installations where OpenStack is managing your Linux VMs on the mainframe because it just uses the libvirt tooling. Um, so that's super cool. Um, ZVM is more feature rich and has a much, much longer history. Um, so there's reasons to use ZVM. Um, but for me, I was like, awesome, like KVM's cool. <laughs> um, so that's how it works. Uh, but some of the history. Um, so in early days of computers, they didn't have time sharing. And time sharing is sort of like the grandfather of virtualization. So if you look back in, in the papers that were published, it was 1959 that the first uh, time sharing paper was published to sort of uh, flesh out the concept. Um, and then in 1961, uh, there was a demo at MIT of a CTSS, which is the first time sharing system on an IBM 709. Um, skipping ahead a few years um, into 1972, this was the first release of, of VM, like which is now ZVM. So it was VM370 on an S370 mainframe. Um, this little teddy bear here is the logo for VM. And one of the things that, that's so fascinating about VM history is how community driven it is. It was universities and companies all working together with IBM to develop this software. Um, and if you're interested in the history, there's like a, a 20 page PDF um, written by Melinda Veridin, who was there and knows all the history of the VM community. Um, and she talks about like all, all the pieces of software that were involved, all the companies and some interesting stories about how this evolved. Um, because it turns out IBM was not fully on board with virtualization at first. Um, these organizations and universities were saying, hey, we need virtualization. And IBM's like, I don't think anyone needs VMs. <laughs> um, and so they, they sort of, in, in, in the history that she wrote, she calls this the doubtful decade because they did have VM 370. It existed, but there wasn't a lot of attention paid to it by IBM. So there was a lot of community effort involved in making sure it was supported and making sure it was tested. And even though it wasn't strictly open source, um, the community around it um, from reading things, it feels very much like an open source community to me. Uh, thankfully, uh, got over it in the 80s. <laughs> uh, IBM came around and they're like, okay, actually VM is a really cool technology and we want to support it. Um, and, then, and then some interesting things happened in the 90s. Um, so traditionally, the way you interacted with the mainframe um, was using, uh, I think it's a, a protocol um, called SNA, which is like a proprietary protocol for machines talking to each other by IBM. It's a systems network architecture. Um, but in 1994, experimental TCP IP, TCP IP support was added. Um, and that was pretty instrumental to getting Linux to run in any meaningful way. Um, I have a question right here. Let's see. Uh, do you have any idea how the Marist College mainframe is used by open source projects is configured? Are all the instances on top of ZVM or KVM? So that's a great question. So I'll I'll take you a little bit to the to the end of this talk here. There is a mainframe at Marist College in New York that is available to open source projects. So you can get a free VM, you can add it to your CI system. This question actually comes from Lance Albertson, um, who works at the uh, OSU Open Source Lab, and they have a CI system that runs on this mainframe. Um, so the question is, are the instances running on ZVM or KVM? Um, they were running on ZVM when the machine was a, a, a Z13, but I believe when they migrated to the Z15, I think they switched over to KVM. That was definitely the plan. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure um, if that's actually what happened, but um, that is what they had planned on doing. So good question and gives you a sneak peek. Like you can get a free free VM. I'll tell you how. <laughs> so back to the history. Um, so the first Linux port for the mainframe was a community driven effort. It was called Bigfoot. 
um, and there's a history of it online. Um, if you go to this website, um, it looks like it's from 1995 because it is. <laughs> Um, it hasn't really been updated, but and and a lot of the links are dead, so I had to go to the Internet Archive to find a bunch of stuff um, that was that was around. Um, but this was a fully community-driven effort, and if you if you remember back to 1999, um, this was early days for the Linux world. It's like when I first ever got Linux installed on a machine. I think a friend installed it for me and was showing me around. Um, but this is the era where people were trying to just it was very hobbyist driven. People were trying to put Linux on everything. There was an essay about how to run Linux on a dead badger. Um, and this is kind of the environment where this community came together and was like, I wonder if we can run it on a mainframe. <laughs> um, and so th there's this list on this website about why they went ahead and put it on the mainframe. So first it was a stunt. Um, secondly, to learn because they wanted to learn how to install an operating system that wasn't necessarily um, built for the mainframe uh, because it's there, because it's gnarly. <laughs> and those those four things are things that really resonate with me because like I am a hardware geek and I love putting Linux on weird things. So like if, if I'm honest, like those are like the real reasons the community ported it. Um, beyond that, you have like, oh, it's got really fast I.O. Remember the data drivenness of mainframes. Uh, VM is a really cool technology. There is technically a business model there, and that's really what IBM latched onto. But the first four, that's what I'm all about. <laughs> because it's there. Why don't you put Linux on it? Put Linux on everything. Uh, and then IBM came around. So in, in speaking with people, so I, I I did a couple of articles about the history of uh, last last fall, and a, a people from the mainframe community kind of came out of the woodwork and was like, actually, it turns out IBM was working on this while the community edition came out. But when the community edition came out, IBM was like, oh, we actually have to like make this public now and talk to these people because we're actually working on this too. So while the community edition was being worked on, IBM was also thinking about Linux. So on December 18th, 1999, uh, 20 years ago last year, uh, the first patches were made and released by IBM for the 2213 kernel. Um, these were not mainlined in any way. They were just patches that IBM said, here, put these on your Linux and it'll go. <laughs> um, and then there were formal product announcements in 2000. Um, there were a few early companies um, that were involved in making their own little distributions. Um, and Marist College was already involved here. They're the ones that run our community mainframes these days. And then we get to the question, so wh why is IBM involved here? So there's this commercial from 2001 called Heist. Um, there's the YouTube link there. You could just look up IBM Heist. And it, it, it's funny, it was, it was given to me by a colleague when I was asking him about history. Um, and he's like, this is a hilarious commercial. So it shows all these guys, the guy, this guy with security saying like, where'd all my computers go? Someone must have stolen them. And at the end, there's an IT guy who says, Oh, they're consolidated on this IBM e server. Like that was the that was the big message is you can take all of your Linux boxes and consolidate them onto a machine. And if you see this banner behind me, that's actually one of the original Linux e server banners. Um, my colleagues found it in a closet and said, Liz would love that. And I was like, Yes, Liz would love that. <laughs> um, so now it's in my home office. Um, so IBM was really behind this, even as early as 2001. Um, of course, press got around to talking about it, like, hey, Linux, Linux is now everywhere. It's even running on mainframes. And so we've had 20 years to work on this. So big things that are happening. Um, so networking was, was greatly improved upon. In addition to just the TCP IP stack, you can communicate between main between VMs um, and between, between Linux LPARs. Um, storage has, has been a huge thing um, since the storage is on a different machine and the communication with that is a lot of the proprietary connectors. Um, getting Linux attached to storage is kind of a big deal. Um, so there's like interfaces and everything that all work with Linux these days. Um, there's now a specific processor that's designed specifically for Linux um, in the mainframe. And so these are called integrated facility for Linux processors, IFLs. So when you buy a machine and you just want to run Linux, you can get the IFL processors and 
the big secret is that they're cheaper <laughs> than the regular mainframe processors um, because you can't run ZOS on them um, or any of the traditional mainframe operating systems. It's just for Linux. Um, and open source became a really big deal, which is what you're here to hear about. <laughs> um, we have a list of validated open source software um, that IBM maintains of stuff that we actually like stand behind. And I'll, I'll get to that in a few minutes. So a couple of things I want to talk about. So one of the really cool things about using Linux on the mainframe is encryption. So each processor, the one I talked about earlier with the 12 cores, they have a crypto coprocessor. And so if you're doing encryption work, um, the encryption uh, processing does not take away from the general processing you have on the machine. So you can do as much, pretty much as much crypto as you want. You can use um, crypto in flight, crypto on disk, and it won't take away from your general processing stuff. Um, obviously this, this has also been replicated on x86 and other platforms at this point, um, but this is something that mainframe has had for a very long time and it's still crazy fast. Um, there's also a Crypto Express adapter, which is one, one of the things that's in your um, IO drawers. And that is a HSM, a hardware security module. So you can put your, um, your crypto keys on that. And if anyone tampers with it, like, well, it's, they're not gonna get to those keys. It's like the highest rated HSM in the industry. So the crypto stuff on these is pretty cool. Um, and how is that used in Linux? Um, so I was a little worried it would be some like binary blob from IBM that you stick into your Linux, but it's not. Um, for encryption on disk, it just uses dmcrypt in the kernel. Um, it hooks into OpenSSL and libcrypto for all of your standard like SSL stuff. Um, if you're doing encryption in flight, you're just gonna use IPsec. Um, so it's all just the standard crypto stuff that we're already familiar with in, in uh, open source world. Um, the picture here on this slide is just a photo of the OpenSSL documentation for the mainframe. And effectively what you do is you edit the config file that already comes with OpenSSL and you add in the S390X bits and suddenly you're using hardware crypto. And I was like, that's so cool. Like we've upstreamed all of this stuff. It's all just in the open source package. Um, so now my SSH is using the hardware crypto. Awesome. <laughs> So I already mentioned IBM was pretty invested in this all the way back to 2000, 2001. But the really big thing that happened in 2015 was that IBM came out with the Linux One. Uh, the Linux One is a mainframe that only runs Linux. So I mentioned those IFL processors that only run Linux. This machine only has IFL, pro or, yeah, IFL processors. And so it can't run anything else, can only run Linux. Um, so it's essentially a Z15, which is the one that came out in September, but it's got IFLs. Um, so there was the Linux one. Um, they used to name them after penguins. They don't do that anymore, which made me sad. But we had the Emperor and the Rock Hopper. Um, funny story, actually, one of my colleagues says he always gets those confused. He's glad we don't use the penguin names anymore because he's like, how do you know which one's the big one? And I'm like, obviously, because the Emperor is the big penguin and the Rock Hopper is the little penguin. And he's like, Liz, not everyone knows about penguins. <laughs> um, but so we had the, the Rock Hopper and the Emperor and then that Rock Hopper 2 and the Emperor 2, and now it's called the Linux 1.3. Um, so it's the third iteration of the Linux 1 machines. Um, so the way you can tell from looking at one, um, it's orange on the outside instead of blue, um, but otherwise, and it says Linux 1 on one of the doors, um, but otherwise they're, they're pretty identical machines aside from the processors. Um, but my point here is like IBM was so serious about their investment in Linux uh, that they made a whole physical machine devoted just to Linux and the brand Linux one. So uh, some of the open source stuff. So um, I mentioned it's not x86. Um, in fact, it's not little Endian at all. Um, it's big Endian. So it's probably, I think it's the only big Endian processor out there anymore that's still actively used. Um, and so it's, uh, it's a different architecture and, and it's got some, some weirdness with, with memory stuff if, if people are trying to do clever things with memory on x86. Um, there's a question here, the difference between the standard and the, um, the, the IFL processors. Um, the difference is, I, I believe it is, it is firmware related. That means they can't run ZOS. Otherwise the processors are pretty much the same. 
Um, they're the same speed and they can do the same things. It's just the, the Linux one cannot be used for the other stuff. There's some firmware in there that says it can't. Um, so, but open source, right? So in order for software to run on S390X on the mainframe, um, it needs to be ported. Um, so I have this open source software list again. Um, and so this is like our, our, like our pretty slide of logos. Um, there's actually like thousands and thousands of packages that have been ported. Um, and when you run Linux on it, you're just running standard Linux distributions. The official ones are SUSE, Red Hat, and Ubuntu. Uh, but Debian has an S390X port. OpenSUSE has one. Fedora, CentOS has a version called Clefos, which is managed by a, a firm that does a lot of mainframe work. Um, and they, they actually have um, the, the Apple repository um, ported as well to some degree. And what it means to have the distribution ported, it doesn't mean every single package has been recompiled. It means the company has done their best effort to port as much as much of the stuff they can as they can. Um, so that means they package it, they build it for the, the, the architecture and they see if it passes their tests. Um, depending on, on the package, they may do additional tests on top of that. Um, and then there's a collaboration between the projects themselves. Some of them actually support um, S390X upstream like Kubernetes and releases S390X binaries. And some of them are maintained by the distribution. Some of them are maintained by IBM with all of the changes being pushed upstream um, when, when they're gonna be accepted. Um, but there's tons of software. So when I first got my first little VM, um, the first thing I installed was a, a text-based chat, chat client so I could hop on IRC and uh, show all my friends the output of, of, of um, proxy PU info. Cause I was like, hey, I, I have a, a VM on a mainframe. <laughs> um, and I can't imagine um, RC, the, the chat client was, was like a customer request. What I suspect happened is they tried to compile it and it worked and then they shipped it. Like, awesome. Like this doesn't need to be on the list. Um, it's not something we're gonna highlight, um, but it compiled fine and it works. Um, and so there's a couple of things I wanna call out specifically on this slide. Um, the first one I mentioned already is Kubernetes. So Kubernetes has been running on S390X for a very long time. I was actually talking to the release manager and I asked him how that port came to be. And he said, I don't know, it predates me. <laughs> so I was like, okay, that's it's been around for a while. So Kubernetes releases binaries. Um, and you might've heard, um, IBM bought a Linux company recently. Um, so uh, OpenShift from Red Hat has become a huge part of part of my work. Um, so OpenShift in February, we released um, OpenShift 4.2 um, for Z, for uh, the mainframe. So you can now run OpenShift on Linux on Z. Um, and we've been releasing um, ever since, I think we're on version 4.4 of OpenShift um, for Z. And so that's that's pretty cool. Um, and then of course, Ubuntu has has a Kubernetes distribution, the canonical distribution of Kubernetes. And OpenSUSE has, uh, what is it, Cubic, I think, which is their distribution. So if you're running um, OpenSUSE Tumbleweed, um, you can use their like, like respin of, of Kubernetes um, on Z, which has been compiled for. Um, the other two things that are really interesting on this slide for me, um, Docker, um, the reason this is interesting is not because there's a port, which I'll, I'll show you, or not, not that people make ports of it, but that you can actually run Docker on ZOS now. So it's not just a Linux side that we're talking about open source. Um, there's something called uh, container extensions, which allow you to run Docker containers inside of ZOS. Um, and then another interesting one on here, what one was I thinking? Ansible, yes. So. You know Ansible, um, it does orchestration, can handle your Linux machines. Um, well, a couple months ago, um, IBM teamed up with Red Hat to release Ansible playbooks for ZOS. So you can now run, use Ansible to control a bunch of the stuff on your ZOS side, which is like awesome because now I'm like, you're finally bringing your mainframe into like this, this infrastructure that me as like a Linux sysadmin is really familiar with. Um, so those are just some of the things I'll, I'll talk about Golang in a few minutes too, because that's, that's a really interesting story. Uh, so we have another question here. Uh, so let's see, when does a mainframe make sense? Uh, 
um, based on application such as HPC or collapsing many racks into a high capacity mainframe. Um, so yes, yeah, so when the mainframe makes the most sense is if you're doing a lot of data processing. Um, what we like to say is if you're a company that's running a bunch of web front ends, like web front ends are not really built for the mainframe. You, we're talking about like stateful services um, that we want to run on them. And in those cases, um, the mainframe is is really good. You can consolidate a ton of x86 machines. I mean, like it depends on what your workload is. That's like the IBM answer. Like it depends, like how many Linux machines can you put in the mainframe? I mean, it depends on exactly what, what your workload is, but you can, I mean, you can, uh, presumably collapse dozens of racks into a mainframe if you're doing a lot of data processing and data storage. Um, and that's really where the power of them comes in. Even if you're running Linux on them or ZOS or whatever you're running, it's really, if you're very data centric, um, that's when the mainframe is gonna make a lot of sense. Um, if you're more about serving stuff and very customer folk, like customer facing with like what, you, what you're presenting, um, it, it may not make as much sense. So we don't try to sell them to everyone because <laughs> it's not gonna make sense for like a, an app store startup, uh, right? Um, and and it is not like really built for HPC workloads. It is still like uh, uh, an enterprise level system. So it's it doesn't have like the superpower of of a high performance computing system. It's not a supercomputer, <laughs> um, but the processors are fast, and these are pretty sick machines. Um, and then uh, another question, a uh, beginner question. If I open top, do I really see 2000 cores? No, and that is because of the LPARs, because your LPAR can be assigned a certain number of processors. And as I mentioned, like those are kind of like physically isolated. And so you will only see the cores that are devoted to that LPAR. And then whether you're using it like, an LPAR with Prism or an LPAR on top of something like KVM or, or ZVM, you'll only see the cores that are, that are devoted to you. Um, if you use more of the standard like mainframe tooling, um, you can actually see at a deeper level. But if you're on Linux, you're only gonna see the, the processor, the ones that are that are given to you because essentially every operating system running on a mainframe is kind of virtualized. So I threw something in there just a second ago, Prism. And that that is that is like, it's not quite virtualization, but it kind of is. Prism is what controls everything that's on the LPAR. And so you're still gonna have like some abstraction from exactly where the hardware is, but there's like, there's, there's no penalty for using that. Um, so that is that, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> it's still cool seeing the processor info though, because you see like, um, there, there's different information I can, I can show you later, but it's, um, you can see the processor speed and the different architecture and other things that are interesting. So, uh, I, I briefly mentioned the verified software list. Um, so this is maintained by a team at IBM um, who upstreams all of the changes and writes documentation on how to build software um, when it's not completely straightforward. Um, so a few weeks ago, I was giving a talk at an IBM event and I built Minikube on um, a HyperProtect server. HyperProtect is our product in IBM Cloud that runs on the mainframe. Um, and so I was able to run Minikube on an S390X box and show them a little bit of like demoing Kubernetes. Um, and so the, the software list will show you like what support exists on RHEL and Ubuntu and SLES, because those are our officially supported ones. It'll tell you whether there's a Docker image for it. Um, typically these are hosted on Docker Hub. Um, and so you can go through this list and sort of find things and see if what you're doing is like, or what, what, you're inter what software you're interested in is like something that we really support and like the, the IBM and the community stand by it. Um, so, I mean, obviously this is just the first few things on the list. And again, this list is not comprehensive. This is really just like what we've specifically focused on, um, but there's tons of other stuff that just works. Um, mentioned Docker Hub. Um, if you've ever poked around Docker Hub at all, you'll notice one of the things you can search for on Docker Hub is by architecture. So you can search by IBM Z and there's, there's a lot of stuff. Um, there's like over a thousand images um, that are up there built for S390X. Um, and then a couple of languages that are really good on the mainframe. So one of them is Java. Um, Java has been a mainstay of the open the, the, the mainframe world for 
decades now. Like it's it's been around a long time. So there's open source tooling that you can use for Java and Linux on Z. And uh, there was this great blog post recently by Trevor Edels. It was like right before I had to turn in these slides and I'm like, oh, these are some great quotes. Um, but it was talking about open source on the mainframe and he was very focused on ZOS. Um, so he was talking about um, using like Maven plugins and, and Gradle and other things to hook into um, uh, something called Kix, C-I-C-S, and that's part of like the traditional mainframe side of things. And he's talking about like open source tools that you can use with the traditional mainframe stack. Um, and then, so that's Java. Java stuff runs really well on the mainframe. Um, and then that's actually an understatement, like Java runs crazy fast on a mainframe. Um, and then Go is an interesting one. So Go was ported to Linux on the mainframe in 2016. Like the first experimental support was put into it in Go 1.7. And so that means Go has been supported for a long time. And like every single time I try to compile a Go package on the mainframe, it works. Like it, it runs really well and it works really well. Um, but the really cool thing, I mean, that, that's cool because like, it's nice when things work. <laughs> um, the other cool thing is that the uh, the crypto AES package in Go actually hooks into the hardware crypto of the mainframe. So when you're using crypto AES, um, you can actually leverage the encryption on on the machine, um, and that's that's really nice because a lot of languages have crypto built into them, um, and if it's at a really high level, it doesn't take advantage of that support in the in the hardware, but that's like one of the big strengths of the mainframe. So it's really nice that Go can actually use it. <laughs> um, sort of getting into the ZOS side of things of, for open source. Um, one of the things a lot of my colleagues see who are like in the field working with customers um, is they, the, the story for the mainframe these days is they keep their traditional ZOS system and they keep their COBOL and they, it works great for them, like it's really nice, but they want a more modern front end. Um, and so what they do is they have these integration layers. So the mainframe does what it really what does, does really well with ZOS and processing data sets and doing batch workloads and the COBOL that was written in 1975, like it's all good, it's fine. <laughs> um, but they wanna hook it into a modern front end. So they'll use something like Swagger to develop an API to point to, so that you're, your front end can now talk to the mainframe back end. Um, the other cool thing is that um, as of the 2014 standard of COBOL, I think, I think, yeah, it, it supports JSON now. So if you point some JSON at your COBOL code, COBOL will know what to do. It knows how to parse JSON. Um, so if you have a web app that outputs stuff in JSON, like COBOL's like, yeah, no problem, I got this. Um, which COBOL, whole different discussion too, because they're working on the 2020 standard, I think. Um, it's all pretty new. Um, so COBOL is actually a, a very live, alive and, and being constantly developed language as well. Um, but it's not really something you write a web app in. <laughs> um, so, uh, another cool thing. So this is the open mainframe project. Um, this is one of the things that made me join IBM in the role that I'm in. Um, I, of course, again, like I'm really open source person. <laughs> so I, I was interested to see the open source tooling that was available. Um, and when I saw that there was a whole project under the Linux foundation that was devoted to developing open source software on the mainframe, I was like, okay, like they're actually serious about doing open source work. Um, so they have several projects under, under their roof. Um, the really big one um, that's sort of like, is like the, the crown jewel of, of their project is called Zoe. Um, actually, my, my colleague, Joe Winchester, did a talk about this two days ago at this summit. So it was called, uh, uh, well, that's a long title. How Open Mainframe Project Zoe is opening up the mainframe. Who says you can't teach an old dog new tricks? So again, this, instead of being on the Linux side, this is on the ZOS side. So what it's doing is it's taking the old system that also, to be clear, has been continually developed and always being modernized as well. Um, <laughs> uh, but it adds like a, a really slick front end to it. Um, and it's all, all done in open source. So I can show you, um, this is ISPF, 
Um, this is how you would traditionally interact with a mainframe. Um, you log into an S39 or log into um, a 3270 terminal. You get into ISPF, um, and we actually have a a project, the Open uh, no, Master the Mainframe, which is a contest from September to December each year. And so students can sign up for it. We also have a learning system for all the rest of us, but students can sign up for it and learn really basics of mainframe, not the Linux side that I've been talking about, but like the ZOS side. Um, and so you're presented with this menu. And this is what I took a screenshot from because I was on the learning system. The first thing it has you do is reset your password. And I messed that up. So I had to reset my password through the bot in Slack. <laughs> um, but it, it's, it's, a UI that that like people who've been working on the mainframe for a long time or people who've gotten really familiar with this UI, they love it. Like they can do things really fast in it um, and they're very familiar with it and they never want to give it up. Um, and I get that like as a Linux sysadmin, like if you ever take away my terminal, like I'm not working on the computer anymore. It's, it's no good. So, but for someone who's new to the mainframe um, or someone who, who wants to learn the coolest new things in technology, this is not the most appealing <laughs> UI. Um, so what Zoe does is it um, adds this API that allows you to build really cool stuff on top of it. So this is a screenshot of the Zoe web desktop and it has, it's got kind of like a start menu on here and then it's got applications that you can launch um, that allow you to do a bunch of stuff. So it still has a 3270 terminal if you wanna use that, but it also has like explorers that allow you to like view different parts of the mainframe. And this was really cool for me because I wanted this like holistic view of what's on the system because I really didn't understand what a mainframe was. I didn't really understand batches or data set. I mean, at an abstract level, but like in the mainframe world, I didn't really understand a lot of that stuff when I was first learning. So these graphical based explorers give you like a much better view and you can interact with it like in this way. Um, so I wouldn't say the desktop is like the web desktop is like something you might use every day or when you become more sophisticated as a user, but for learning, um, it's really it's really an interesting tool. Um, there's also the CLI, and this is the one I'm really excited about because with the CLI, you just install this Zoe package on whatever machine you're on, like your laptop or whatever x86 machine you're on, and then you can run mainframe specific tasks using the Zoe command line. Um, obviously, you need to be connected to your mainframe, and so you need to have access to that. Um, and we don't just open them up to the whole world. So your desktop has to be one of the privileged few <laughs> who can attach to the mainframe. Um, but what this allows you to do is, is build all kinds of interesting things. So the CLI has been used to build a Visual, Visual Studio Code extension. So you can use VS Code connected to your mainframe and like run things um, so you can have a, a nice modern IDE. Um, but the really cool thing for me coming from like a CI CD background is that you can also do like lots of automation and scripting and you can add things to your CI CD pipeline. Um, it actually came out too late to add to these slides, but there was a, an engineer from Broadcom who just wrote a, a medium art, medium.com article about using circle CI to install the Zoe CLI and then run tests on the mainframe, gather those results. And then it's just part of their CI system. And I'm like, that's super cool because you didn't even need like circle CI didn't even need IBM Z support. It just used the Zoe CLI on x86 to do the call out to the actual mainframe that you already have. So that's the CLI. And then the API, the API, as I mentioned, that's like what makes all of this possible. Um, so again, if you wanna go back and find Joe Winchester's talk about this on Monday, um, he goes into much deeper um, stuff about Zoe because that's what his talk was about. So open mainframe project, they have other projects out there. Um, I'll just I'll just highlight a couple of them. One of them is syntax highlighting um, for, for for ZVM stuff. Another one's like anomaly detection engine for Linux logs, because one of the things that a lot of mainframers have struggled with was like Linux logs are like secretly stored somewhere on the Linux and they don't know the Linux. So <laughs> this, this helps like bring the logs into a place where all the rest of the mainframe logs are and, and helps them figure out what's going on. Um, some of these projects like um, uh, some of them are like more like mentorship programs. Um, there's a new COBOL course. Um, Feilong is an, in an interesting one. Um, it's, it creates a ZVM cloud connector. So I talked about using op like something like OpenStack and KVM. So this allows you can use OpenStack with ZVM 
and allows you to use this cloud connector. Um, and so that's that's been a thing. Um, polycephaly is a really interesting one too, because that allows you to do ZOS with Jenkins and Git. So you can use all of your traditional um, like uh, ZOS stuff, but you can use a modern CI CD pipeline. Um, another interesting one is Zaro. So this one is not like, it's not really code, but it is um, OSMF workflows um, so that people can share like this open repository of, of the way they do things. Um, and then this year we, we added a few more projects that I don't have pictures of. <laughs> um, so one of them is the COBOL programming course. Um, that's one that IBM worked on with American River College. And now there's like a bunch of other contributors because it's in GitHub. Um, so there's people developing for the uh, programming course in COBOL. Um, there's an education working group. And then the one that I'm working on is the software discovery tool. And that allows you to search for open source projects um, that, that run on Z. Um, it'll kind of replace the, the verified software list that we have, but it'll also search like all kinds of um, software packages on all those distributions. Um, and then your own software, you can build it for the mainframe. Um, there's a few really easy ways to do it. Uh, so um, uh, Canonical has a service called Launchpad. And on Launchpad, when you upload your dev package to a PPA, a personal package archive, one of the options is you can like check a box and it'll build for S390X. It's really that simple, but I, I wrote a whole blog post about it last year anyway. <laughs> um, there's also the OpenSUSE build service. This one, you don't even need to check a box. As soon as you upload your package, it automatically builds it to, for a bunch of different architectures. Um, and one of those architectures is S390X. Uh, one of the things we were really excited about last November, I actually went to um, uh, GitHub Universe and like was hanging out at the Travis booth um, because we announced that we now support um, IBM Z and IBM Power um, on Travis for open source projects. So if you're an open source project using Travis CI, you can add the S390X builder to your project for free and you can play around with it and you essentially just get to build on whatever platform you want. They had already supported ARM. Um, so can install it, you can build your package wherever. And that was pretty cool. Um, and this this actually uses the Marist College uh, uh, server too, the community driven one. And I think it uses another one in the, maybe in Texas. <laughs> um, but we donated the resources to Travis CI community so open source projects could play around with this. And then the, the thing that uh, Lance had mentioned in his question earlier, um, we give, a, give away VMs to um, open source developers and really anyone who wants one, um, you go to developer.ibm.com slash Linux one and you get a free VM for 120 days. Um, you can install, I think and it's, it's either rel or SLES. You get to choose which one you install and then you can play around with a VM and it's a pretty beefy VM too. It's got like a bunch of RAM and CPU. It's, it's a pretty nice machine. Um, they're automatically shut off after 120 days, but you can just sign up again. <laughs> um, the one thing I'll say is that if you're, if you're an open source project and you're actually getting really serious about wanting to test on this and you want a VM from us, um, just drop me an email. Um, my email will be on the last slide. Um, and I, I can get you hooked up because we have a, a team inside of IBM that gives out VMs for open source projects, specifically for their infrastructure. So that's fun. Um, and that that is where I want to conclude. <laughs> Um, so it looks like we've got a couple minutes for questions. So I'm just going to look through this question list and see if there's anything I missed. Um, if anyone else has questions, please, please let me know. Let's see. Um, this slide also has my, my personal address and my email and my, my work email. So lyz at ibm.com or lyz at princesslea.com. Find me at either one. Um, I do most of my open source work under my personal address. So that's where you can generally find me. All right, it looks like there aren't any more questions really. Um, let's just double check here. Well, if you if you think of any, um, feel free to reach out to me at either email address. Uh, find me somewhere on the internet. I'm pretty easy to find. Um, I'd be happy to help you out. So thank you, everybody. <laughs>